Good morning and welcome on behalf of Town Baptist Church. Shall we start with a prayer? Heavenly Father, wherever we're watching, we ask that your Spirit will be with us, guiding our understanding of this passage of Scripture, the passage we're studying today. Highlight to us what is relevant to our situation and forgive us when we misunderstand what you're saying. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. Well, my name's Ian and I must begin with a confession. I'm fascinated by news. In fact, I'm an addict, a newsaholic. I spend far too much of my life watching news bulletins on TV. And then, oh, oh, and the internet as well. And then I uh, watch the analyses in various interview programs on politics and other things. Anyway, I have a need to know what's going on in the world. I'm also a history addict. Because you can't understand the, the present unless you understand the past. A lot of the time, I just collect useless facts. But in a time like the present, very few facts are useless. Very few facts are irrelevant. And the world's changing so quickly that in this global, it's a globally organized world and almost every news item links to others. Often those which are apparently completely, completely separate and to get a balanced view takes time. This series we're following, Songs for a Time of Crisis. It's not a time of one, ours isn't a time of one crisis, it's a time of several. The biggest crisis is global warming which is caused by the careless destruction of God's good creation. To a lot of people, this crisis is something which will become critical in the future. However, if you're trying to get a mortgage in a place like Fairborn, it's critical now. The bad news for Fairborn is that last summer, a record amount of the Greenland ice cap melted and ran into the sea contributing to the rising sea level, which is threatening coastal communities like Fairborn. And it'll go on to threaten many major cities around the world, built near the coast. Climate change is also critical for you now. If you're one of those people who are still clearing up after a second or third, once in a lifetime, flood you've experienced in the last decade or so. For most people, however, the most immediate crisis is COVID-19, the potentially fatal disease caused by the new virus. This disease, classed as a pan pandemic, one that would spread over several countries, and indeed it now has become global. Now, pandemics are not that uncommon. This country, like most of Europe, prepares for a pandemic every year. The an annual influenza season is a pandemic, which is held in check only by the appropriate vaccination. And flu comes in several varieties, and it's impossible to vaccinate for all of them in one go. However, this year, the people who prepare the vaccine chose wisely and the annual annual flu was a totally a thankfully a non-event. This year we had a new virus instead, the COVID-19 virus, which is similar to the flu virus, but as it's only recently been discovered, there's no vaccine. There's no defence against it. 
Pandemics, however, are not new. A hundred years ago, we had Spanish flu. It infected about 500 million people, a third of the world's population. And it killed between 20 and 50 million. That's a far greater proportion than COVID-19 is likely to. Since then, we've had bird flu in 2005 in Asia. Swine flu in 2010, which spread through East Asia, North and South America and Europe. We've also had Ebola, which has been breaking out in West Africa since 1976. All these caused significant numbers of deaths. We've always had pandemics. The old word for them is plagues. In the NIV translation of the Bible, the word plague occurs 109 times, and the word disease 65 times. So the Bible's got a lot to say on the subject. And today we're going to concentrate on Psalm 130. It was a song sung probably by pilgrims as they went up to the temple. And here's what they sang. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord, pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might fear you. Sorry, I'll do that one again. You offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. Significant difference. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I've put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for, long for the dawn. Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Now we don't know why the psalmist was in such despair. It may have been a plague, a disease of some sort, or it may have been some sort of crop failure leading to a famine. It may be that it was political and an enemy was threatening the nation. But that's unlikely because most of the psalmists were not shy of calling down God's wrath on Israel's enemies. And this one's exceptional in that there's none of that in this psalm. We don't know what the cause was. But the writer obviously didn't know which way to turn. Verses 1 and 2 in, again. From the depths of despair, the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Rather than being worth worshipful, he almost demands God's attention. Though in the next verse, he admits that the underlying cause is the sinfulness of mankind. Now in our current situation, the cause of our despair is COVID-19, the disease caused by a virus which has just emerged. And people all over the world are asking the question, why? Why has it happened? Why has it spread so fast? And so on. Many Christians are asking, why does God allow it? Why did he create viruses? Well, viruses are useful. Without some viruses, we would all be poisoned by the bacteria in our food. 
I suppose the next question is why did God create bacteria? Good bacteria further down our bodies break down that food so we can digest it. And without them we would starve to death. Both viruses and bacteria are part of our ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. We depend on them. No, God didn't create this particular virus to deliberately cause suffering. The cause of this virus was either lack of hygiene in a food market or sloppy handling in a laboratory. Uh, opinion now tends towards the food market. We can discount the theory that it was developed as a biological weapon. It's a useless weapon that kills all the elderly non-competents but leaves most of the soldiery fight, fighting fit in a few days. John's Gospel tells us of a day when Jesus and his disciples came across a blind man. It goes like this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? The disciples immediately start the blame game. It must be somebody's fault. That might be true, but Jesus isn't interested in that game. He completely ignores that question. The question he answers is, what can we do about it? He says, this happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. In other words, get on with it. The Bible does link disaster and misfortune with sin. Right at the beginning in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, it tells the story of a garden, a garden with two trees at the center. One of those trees represents everlasting life. The other represents knowledge, knowledge both good and evil. And God told mankind not to touch either of those trees. But mankind was greedy and mankind was impatient, too impatient to wait until God had taught them wisdom. They wanted to discover knowledge for themselves. They didn't want to wait until God gave them the godly wisdom to safely handle such knowledge, such knowledge without straying into sin. The psalmist takes the same attitude as Jesus has. Verses 3 and 4 go like this. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. This fear that comes from God's forgiveness is not the fear and trembling sort of fear. This fear is the sort that leads to respect, the respect for a wise boss or a wise God, respect which leads to wisdom. Wisdom's another word that occurs frequently in the Bible, 215 times in fact. Both the Old and the New Testaments are very big on wisdom. People remarked on the wisdom of Jesus with his healing power. When he spoke in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, the people remarked, where did he get all this wisdom and, to, and the power to perform such miracles? But though they praised his wisdom and acknowledged his healing power, they still couldn't see him as anything but that carpenter they'd grown up with 
that carpenter they knew, and so they didn't follow him. In the book of Acts, when Stephen was preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem about Jesus, they argued with him, but none of them could stand against what the spirit-given wisdom with which he spoke. Wisdom and the work of the Holy Spirit go together. And our psalmist shows that wisdom when by the inspiration of the Spirit, he goes on in verse 5. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I put my hope in his word. And the psalmist is impatient, impatient for change. Verse 6. I long for the Lord, more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. Just as Jesus used the blindness of the blind beggar to show the healing power of God, so God can use COVID-19 for good. He can use his keen healing power to change our society. Some people are longing for things to go back to how they were, but they're in a minority. A YouGov poll found that only 9% of those questioned wanted life to return to how it was before. 9%. 51% said they'd noticed the air was cleaner, and 27% said they'd seen more wildlife. 40% said there'd been a stronger sense of community and the feeling of neighbours looking after for each other. About the same number are more in touch with friends and family, aided by the boom in video chats. And 54%, 54% agreed with the statement, I hope to change things about my life. And I hope we will have learned from this as a country. Hope. Hope is abroad in this world. And hope like a virus is contagious. But is it Christian hope? Is it hope in Jesus? Or is it a vague optimism? If it's optimism, that's as good as, good as it far as it goes. Some good may come of it but for a lasting effect. It needs to be converted to a hope in Jesus. The question used to be asked, why did Jesus' earthly ministry take place when it did? One answer is communications. The Roman Empire provided a network of roads and of shipping lanes that wasn't bettered for about 2,000 years. Within a couple of generations, the good news of God's kingdom, the good news of the gospel, had reached Spain in the west. It had reached China in the east. It had reached Britain in the north and Ethiopia in the south. Now the world's digital. Think what Paul would have done with the internet. And it's time for the 21st century church, a connected church, to catch Paul's vision, vision and use what's available to it in building God's kingdom. Because it's a, it's a connected world out there, waiting for a connected church. A world that needs to hear a 21st century vision of the last verses of the song that the pilgrims sang as they went to, went to the temple. Here's a 21st century version. Hope lies in the Lord Jesus. For with the Lord there's unfailing love. His redemption overflows and he's bringing in his father's kingdom.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with our despair and our fears. And I'll pause for a moment so each of us can bring our fears to the Father. Forgive us, Father, for our lack of trust and teach us about your love for us, the perfect love that was shown by Jesus in dying for us on the cross. Again, I'll pause for a moment for us to think about that love, think about the cost and think about the result. Father, it says in your word that perfect love expels all fear. So, Lord, teach us to love you as you love us and to love each other as you love us. Again, I'll pause. Lord, in your love, you promise us eternal life. So let your love transform our fears into hope. A certain hope based on your unfailing love. Lord, let that hope grow in us as we feel ourselves growing in your kingdom. Amen. Let that be our prayer as we grow up in hope and grow in the love of God in the weeks ahead.